This episode of Tales from the Lot is sponsored by ShakedownT-Shirts.com. With unique lot-style t-shirts, license plate frames, coffee mugs, and all sorts of things for Grateful Dead, Fish, Zappa, Panic, and more. ShakedownT-Shirts.com, where all U.S. orders over $35 ship free. And just for Tales from the Lot listeners, use the code LOT20 for 20% off of any order. That's L-O-T-2-0. Tales from the Lot, episode four, doing questionable things in questionable places. My guest is Keith Eaton, here to talk about 10989, formerly the Warlocks, at Hampton Coliseum. You know it's going to get stranger, so let's get on with the show. Hi, welcome to Tales from the Lot. I'm Will. My guest today is Keith Eaton. We're here to talk about 10989, uh, one of the Warlocks shows. Uh, welcome, Keith. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you make it to both nights, by the way, of the Warlocks? Uh, no, I did not. Um, <laughs> I actually, uh, funny funny story, my mother was visiting uh, where I was living in Washington, D.C., um, and I think that was Columbus Day weekend, thereabouts. Yeah. Um, and she wow. sort of had this tradition of like coming down to D.C. to visit me from Maine. Um, so, you know, first night was like, you know, sacrifice to like, I'm with my mom. Right. Yeah, you made it, <laughs> you made it to one. It's, yeah, you can't complain too much. So, um, and then, okay, so we're, you're, you're in the Northeast now. You're in Maine. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, and where did you grow up? Uh, which, are you, have you always been in I that mean, area? I, our family moved around a lot, but my family is really roots in Maine and Massachusetts. Right. Pretty on. much. And, uh, what kind of music was hip uh, as you were growing up back then? In well, I, you know, I'm the youngest um, of four. <laughs> And, and and who's the youngest of you know like my dad was the youngest of four so i have like cousins older brothers and sisters so i mean there was the whole overalls 1970s allman brothers thing and you know dead records were always part of our record collection and stuff and the stones were paramount yeah. you know um so that you know that was like my childhood music and then the, then like punk rock really like kind of changed my life sorry to quote d boon but you know <laughs> yeah I, um, yeah i was i was sort of there with the punk rock for a while as well right yeah. Now, like yeah like dead kennedy's sort of mid late 80s era in there um, and hardcore right. was awesome you yeah. know and, and, and i think what it what i loved about it was that for our age group you know it was like the you know, I'd always heard the stories about the 70s and, oh, you should have been there for this or you should have been there for that. And, you know, it, it felt very now yeah. and alive. And, and everyone who was doing it was like under the age of 24. It was kind of wild. Yeah. When uh, my, my sister and I, one of my sisters and I uh, were little, we used to listen to the Casey Kasem uh, Top 40 Countdown, you know, like an AM transistor radio, like, you know. 1975 like that was a big deal yeah i listened to a bit of that i was i was more the rick d's era in the uh, in like the late 80s <laughs> yeah i noticed that one of your questions was <clears throat> what's the first album yeah yeah it was thought. yeah and i had to really think about that for a while i was like damn like one of one of the first ones i remember buying mm -hmm. um was a gift for my brother and it must have been like Christmas of 76 or 77. And I got him um, a, a copy of the Stones uh, uh, album. I think it's Black and Blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, oh, the Stones, are they're so like, they're so done. You know, it's like, that's so past, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, why little did we know? <laughs> yeah, you know? Little did we know. <laughs> and, uh, hating on it and stuff so like as a kid you know i'm like damn he really hates this shit so like i love that record hot That's, stuff yeah yeah it's, well, it sounds like you came from a pretty a good musical home there like you know with the references you've said so far that I, I was kind of the same way it's nice to to have a nice musical background that's diverse and and, and cool so and so you had some dead records. So you've always known about the dead, and, and did you have friends that were going, or how did you uh, end up going to see them, or or even uh, getting into that sort of thing? You know, I mean, it, it's sort of in the water, right? Uh, in that era, um, and I think, um, I mean, aside from the fact that we'd skip school and had to hide from people, and you know, do all these crazy <laughs> things to 
be liberated uh, that day that we went. Um, you know, it was just more, I think, because, like, yeah, the dead are playing. It wasn't like I was deadhead or, or, or obsessed with the Grateful Dead. It was like, this is going to be fun and it's an yeah. adventure. And, you know, it was an experience. Yeah, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what it was for a while for me. It's like a thing. And, <clears throat> you know, like I said, I was like in punk rock and stuff. And, like, the the scene was more interesting than, than the show. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the characters you meet. The people who are traveling, the people who have like stuff to say about like, you know, music and life in America and stuff like that was interesting. The food is better. (laughs) (laughs) I think at age 15, I was more into the warm Budweiser, but yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. I remember I was, uh, I think I was, I was at Deer Creek and uh, it was summer solstice 93, I think. And I I remember a guy was, I don't think it was Budweiser, but he was selling some beer and he's like, uh, it's 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 the first day of summer. You've got more time to drink today than any other day of the year. Let's go, and uh, uh, th- that's what you know, like just one of those things that sticks with you. But right, you know, right. from those times. But okay, so what was the first dead show you went to? Um, it was uh, September seventeenth in nineteen eighty two, in Cumberland County Civic Center in Portland, Maine. Okay, nice. And then how many did you, you know, get to overall when, when Jerry was still with us? You know, I see, I saw Jerry play about 120 times. Um, nice. uh, a bunch of those Jerry shows. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I saw about like 101 Great for Dead shows. Um, you know, most of them between like 1985 and 1990, pretty much. Yeah, those were good um, years. Kind of tapered sort off. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there were some good years and uh, and then some good years in there. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, it depends who you talk to and it depends your experience and yeah. <clears throat> all of that. Is that kind of your favorite era to go back to when you're listening to them these days? You know, I think I'm like a lot of people. I, I go back to the one drummer. I'm like, I got to listen to 73. I mean, if I have a four-hour stretch of, like, uninterrupted time, mm-hmm. you know, Night, right. There's nothing like a 1973 show, man. For sure, yeah. You get like a weather report or something. And well, and then it goes this. into some jazzy, like, yeah. I mean, in fish parlance, like a type two, like, formless jam and, you know, finds the other one somewhere and maybe dissolves into something else. And that's, yeah. you know, to me, that's the goods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you, you know, a musician yourself? Nice. What's that? Are you a musician? No, no. I'm just, I, someone's got to be a fan. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned the one drummer thing, so I was like, ah, oh, maybe he's a drummer since he's uh, honing in on that. I just love the way it's tight. You know, there's, it, 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 it's also it's tight, but it also leaves more room to listen. Yeah. Not as busy. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. I'm a I'm a big Mickey fan. I kind of like the two drummer era, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. You've heard the uh, shoe in the laundry <laughs> metaphor, I'm sure. Uh, I, I'm not. I don't think so. What is it? Oh, really? Uh, uh, well, when <laughs> someone was asking to uh, describe the like benefits of the one drummer or the two drummer thing, someone asked Jerry, I think, or maybe it was Phil. When he's talking about like, well, what are the drawbacks of the two drummer thing? And he goes, sometimes it sounds like there's a, a shoe in the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, it, it, and and I kind of feel that way too. I feel like there are times maybe they could pull it back a little bit, like right, you know, like they get a little over anxious. But are are you seeing Dead and Company these days? I would if I had the chance. I, I uh, <clears throat> um, the closest chance I had was this Labor Day weekend, um, and it being a Thursday Friday, and it being like a seven hour drive from where I live. You know, it was like on the holiday near Cape Cod, you know, you start mounting these things on. It's like, no way I couldn't uh, pull that off. I would, if they played in Maine. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They didn't seem to get up there. I saw them at Fenway a couple of times, uh, went down to Hampton in 2019. Nice. That was awesome. Yeah. Revisit that. Are you, yeah, are you a mayor? Hampton. Oh, nice. Yeah. I noticed the shirt. I was kind of fixated on that actually. <laughs> 
Cool. And okay, so um, so the you were visiting with family, and and who did you have your brothers go with you? Who who went with you to see this warlock show? Oh yeah, so um, I <clears throat> that morning um, would have been ten nine eighty nine. Mm-hmm. Woke up to tear my room apart because I realized that my ticket was gone. <laughs> Uh, the ticket that I, you know, my magic Willy Wonka ticket, you know, the beautiful gold lettered whole Warlocks thing was, was gone. And I tore my room apart trying to find it. And, and clearly enough, it was someone had nabbed at a, a party we'd had, uh, you know, the week before. Yeah. Uh, I lived in a big like punk rock house and we had crazy parties and stuff. And so someone clearly, you know help themselves to more than just my drugs, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I've lived in one of those houses back in the day, so I, I know how that goes. Luckily, no, nobody ever stuck my tickets, but definitely other things. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so I went down very anxious. Um, it all worked out. Saw some people from Maine, and they're like, don't worry about it, dude. You know, like one of the classic things where you're, you're so sweating it and so anxious and like, oh, my life is going to end. What am I doing here? Oh, you know, and then yeah, yeah. Uh, then some guy like walks up to you like, hey, bro, how's it going? I'm like, do you need to take it? You're like, yeah. Fantastic. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and uh, was there, so it was a surprise show from, you know, the, the little bit of research. I mean, I, I listened to this tape a bunch, but, you know, through the years, but I never really did research on it or too much. So right. We were going to talk about it. It seems so. It was sort of a surprise thing, and tickets were sold sort of in a unique way. I guess that like they weren't through Ticketmaster right. or something. But uh, was it sold out? I mean, was there was there a ton of people there? What what was the yeah. what was it like when you got there? So the thing is, I mean, like the reason why they did all that stuff is that like the the Grateful Dead had sort of outgrown the Hampton Coliseum, but the Grateful Dead loved playing the Hampton Coliseum. Clearly. Gotcha. Like the the audio is incredible, the energy is incredible. To, you know, it's always the kickoff to spring tour, or whatever. You know, for years in the eighties. Um, and I think they were really trying to curb the enthusiasm, right? I mean, <laughs> sorry, Larry David, but uh, you know, trying to trying to like quell the um, the, the crowd rush by announcing a. a, a couple of shows a week I think it was like a week maybe 10 days before the shows uh, when they were announced on the radio locally um, and, and tickets went on sale at the Coliseum itself hmm. and friends of mine drove down from DC and they were able to hook me up with the uh, whatever it was 109 ticket um, and it was pretty mellow that way you know it wasn't like over overwhelmingly crowded like shows later in that tour would become because word got out right right they, they and they were seeing that huge surge that year. that was yeah it was part of the whole touch of years. surge yeah, yeah. I, I still find it hard to believe that it was that so i mean like I, like i was sort of part of that surge i guess like i jumped on in 91 but it wasn't because i liked touch of gray right uh, right so yeah. I, I, the song it's not the song right you know because um, it's a great song I mean yeah yeah it's, yeah, it's not a bad it's yeah. I love it like the, the my first show was the second version they ever played and I love I listen to that a lot I'm like yeah you know yeah um, and it's but it's anthemic right it's like it's about the whole community yeah that the whole community will survive despite this uh, Nancy Reagan, whatever 1980s drug war we have against you, despite the boot heel on your throat, we will survive, you know? And there was kind of, and, and there was sort of like, a, like, you know, control for smilers can't be bought, right? Like there's this kind of, um, you, you know, you can try to put this down, but it's going to stick around, right. you know, you're stuck with it kind of thing. Um, so to me, it's not the song in, in so much that the scene became acceptable. It became like, okay, maybe yeah. go do that. Yeah. And Whereas previously it wasn't. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah, and there's just the publicity in general from, you know, whether you like the song, even heard the song or not, there was just a lot of 
publicity and sort of push behind that record from from whoever and uh so you know they were they were showing up on like cnn or wherever and, and just everybody was definitely hearing about them at that time no i remember i was living in burlington vermont that summer and uh it was summer 87 and we were like looking at and you know i'd never even seen mtv before really but my roommates had cable and stuff and i was like wow we were all watching the like the video and stuff like wow they're playing it a lot like this is yeah. weird they did yeah. play that video a lot it, it, and it's weird to see him mashed in there with like Michael Jackson and whatever else was going on that day, you know. But oh, like really, but the worst of '80s Eric Clapton, like. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. Hey, that was good. Yeah, that was sort of the highlight of that. <laughs> the MTV mm -hmm. day, probably. <laughs> let's, let, let's give them something to talk about, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jerry like played like played with her. She opened up for Jerry at the Greek that summer. You know, Jerry mm -hmm. played like on her on that song. I think you know people with Greek. Right. Like, yeah. I was supposed to see her a few years ago here in Denver. Open up for James Taylor, and she had some sort of uh, medical issue and right. had to cancel had to cancel a leg of the tour. And uh, so I was kind of disappointed in that. I was looking forward to it, but JT came out and played two sets, played a couple of her songs. And uh, so it was, you know, it was still cool, but I would, sure would have liked to see Bonnie, you know, but maybe yeah, next he, time. And, and James is amazing, isn't he? It's like, yeah, yeah. You how could, old I, are you? And he, like his voice sounds so good. Just like the record, man. Still like, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I saw Crosby, Stills and Nash. They st I mean, it's probably been five years. So, you know, from what I've seen lately, David Crosby may not be doing as well, but five years ago, they were still sounding like the record. It, I went and saw them and. Right, just blown, blown away uh, at right. how well they were still just doing the thing. It's Steven Stills, not so much, but the other two. No, right before uh, uh, the pandemic hit, um, we actually went and saw uh, uh, Graham Nash at the Criterion Theater in Bar Harbor, um, and he was amazing. Yeah. And then, like, six weeks later, David Crosby was supposed to play, and uh, or he was six months later, I don't know, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere <laughs> in the and uh and he canceled because he was he was sick and i was like damn it yeah. um and then he's never rescheduled but that's a bummer um those guys still bring it you know they yeah. try they yeah, try they do and they bring whatever they have yeah and they're just such great songs i mean I was like, like, the other morning i was just laughing before work like looking at uh some article about bobby on TikTok. You know, like showing out his like muscular workout every morning. I'm right. Like, Fuck yeah. yeah! Like you're Bob Weir, man. Go for it, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, who would have thought? It would have been nice to see. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He he uh, he's been on the bike and and hiking and running for you know as long as I've known him. So that's oh yeah. He's just that's awesome. Like, keep it up, dude. Evidently, it's something good because he's still kicking it like two words solid. As, as Bill Graham once said, a very, very ebullient, but very dirty softball player, Mr. Bob Weir. <laughs> dirty but softball player. Huh? Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me. All the, all, the, all the rock stars are, right? So, okay, so who, who ended up going to the show with you? And, uh, and you know, do you have good seats when you, when you or, what, what was a GA probably, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean... So, like, going to a show with someone, I mean, uh, in those days, uh, I would just show up to a show. You know, yeah. it's like, uh, I, I did happen to drive <clears throat> a couple of very cool people who were freshmen at American University. I was a, a super senior, I think they're called. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, you know, they were just needed a ride down and, and we rode down together and they were, they were really like helped me calm down and realize it was going to be okay. Even though I had a ticket stolen and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they're just kind of cruising along for their first experience. And I'm like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, fuck, I missed like helps of Franklin's last night. You know, like I knew already what the set list was from the night before. You got the, the full on FOMO. Oh man. Yeah. They called him from a pay phone. Like, can you hear help? Uh, you. <laughs> you know. that's, that's awful. 
I know. That's awful. And like, I'm with my mom. (laughs) 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 Uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, so so one one thing I would just say, it's really, really hard. And and I and I listened again too. I listened to not the entire show, but everything up through um, drums. Um, and I was listening to the first set intently because to me, like when I listen back over the years, it might be like, eh, the first set, pff, throw away, whatever. Mm-hmm. But what, you know, what's hard to, to describe is the tension. And so like at a dead show like that, where it's not a dead show, it's the, formerly the Warlocks, and people are so keyed up, they're so excited for something big to happen that I, I don't know that I've ever been anywhere where there's like that much anxiety in one room. Mm-hmm. Like collective, I guess that you would, in, in modern day terms, you'd call it anxiety, like just like frenzy, you know? Mm-hmm. So that for them to like open with playing and then in the second set and like, and then like we're gonna hang back and play it slow it is like it, it loses something on tape because what you're feeling in person is this this like mad rush of energy that's like focused on these musicians and the stage and everything else mm-hmm. and, and what they're communicating to you is like no just slow down yeah i thought it was a, a beautiful choice i mean like it, it is something you know what I mean? that, yeah it's something that they know i mean there's no there's no chance they're going to mess this one up so let's just play it and then have that nice open section to where we can just explore and see what happens that that's that's what it felt like you know like right but if you were you know if you were on tour in 85 86 87 88 you know it's like playing could be like a, a six minute seven minute like slam through all these different psychedelic choices at a really high rate of speed Mm mm-hmm and this was like, well, we're going to slow it down a little bit. We're going to downshift. And I think that's the palpable um, feeling. Like that's the gravitas that comes through when you're experiencing that, right? Is um, we're, we're going to slow it down and we're going to go back to like maybe having some dead moments, moments that don't work. But we're going to try something new, mm-hmm. which they yeah. hadn't done for years. Yeah, it, it, you know, especially I think after the first set. The first set I felt was a, a little, a little quick. A little, you know, there's yep. a lot of fast songs, and the music never stopped. Was it was cool? There were some really cool sounds. That this is sort of new MIDI uh, tech. Yeah, were, built to last was the second song. It's like yeah. That's like there a total are. MIDI solo, right? It's like a yeah, they had some new toys they were busting out there, and so like, I feel like that first set was it was definitely solid and had some 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 good moments, but it, but I also the tension was sort of there with the band too. I felt like they were anxious and not really. It was good, but it wasn't over the edge yet. But like, yeah, right. the plan gave them room to breathe. I think and, that the, the the if you really want to feel that, you have to listen to uh, the Memphis Blues. And really crank up the twisted Bobby of like, you know, when he would scream and do his little like anxious moments, like, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> I actually wrote the most notes about that, uh, about really? that Memphis Blues. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like, I, I'm a sucker for Dylan. Th- that might be my favorite Dylan song that they play, uh, mm-hmm. just because of Bobby's delivery. I mean, I like Desolation Row. I like, I like all of them, but, but just the, the imagery and, and as Hornsby said one time, the silliness of Dylan. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and the imagery that comes through in that particular song is just, uh, I, for me, that like it just, I don't know, it hits me. They like, smoked just, my just... eyelids and punched my cigarettes. Yeah, I know that uh, one was Texas Medicine, the other was Red, red Eye Gin, and, and like a fool, I mixed them, you know, like, yeah. just, just the imagery of all of that is just so And if good. you're there on the floor at a Warlock show, and you did one, two, my, uh, you know, yeah, what did you whatever's, make? you know, then you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, 
and that feel like a stranger the opener that's the one from uh, without a net so yeah, um, yeah. It, it just it, the sound I think is the so cool. is the real sleeper of that set yeah, yeah. I actually went back and listened to that because I didn't really, I couldn't remember it, and it was like, oh, okay, it's just it's Jack and Rowe, and that's what it is. And yeah, uh, but to have that just be like tossed off, like, yeah. hey, just what we do. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's definitely solid. Interesting on, on Jack and Rowe, it got me uh, remembering uh, again in '93 or maybe it's '94 at Deer Creek. They, they played Jack and Rowe the first night and the third night, and I was like, do, do I remember that correctly? Ooh. And then, so I had to go back and look, and I, yeah, I do remember it correctly. It was a, just sort of That's a weird, weird so anomaly. Gary had a memory problem then, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah, that the show they also did that weird, like backwards Dark Star out of space and Terrapin? No, nah, I don't. I don't. Was that was that Deer Creek '94? I don't think. I don't remember Deer Creek getting a Dark Star, but I. I it, that's why I do this show because my my, my memory is yeah, a little. Either '93 or '94. There's a really cool. Maybe it's like it's been a train wreck show so far, and then it, mm-hmm. they they play Terrapin. It's like one of those late years when Terry just Jerry just locks into Terrapin, mm-hmm. and then they do this long jam out of Terrapin, drum space, dark start. It's like, what? Maybe yeah. I, you may I have was, been there. I was definitely <laughs> there if it happened any time between ninety one and ninety five. But but like I said, you know the what, what I remember of being there is a different story. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually went to 89 uh, Deer Creek and then 1990. That's another story, but um, the like whole momentum going into the Warlock shows was like, you know, I went to like the summer tour and that the ending of like, well, not the ending, but like Alpine, like 7 mm-hmm. Holy shit. Like they broke out like. We bid you good night, and like, you know, there's just this feeling at, at that moment of like, maybe it was nostalgia for the '60s, um, and yet it was living memory. Yeah, it was living, right? It was still there, and so, so sort of like both feelings happening simultaneously. What, what and that cool? right into the Warlocks thing, man, and, and there had just been. A Jerry tour on the East Coast, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I had just seen Jerry Band at like Meriwether and Philly. Um, they ended their tour at like the Old Orchard <laughs> Beach, like softball field, you know. Like the, Jerry Band had done his, they'd done his work in September. Yeah. So I love Jerry and Jerry Band. Like, I mean, I like the dead, but I feel like Jerry just kicks a little more ass in, in JGB for me. He's all, like, he's screaming his lyrics and he's, his, his solos are a little, you know, a little bit more. And, you know, people could say that maybe he didn't like to be the front man, but he seemed like he liked it when he was in JGB. Well, and that tour was magical because for a lot of us and, and my older sister, most more than me, than me, um, was that it was a reminder of what shows were like pre touch of gray era. Um, because, you know, no one was paying attention to JGB in 1989 and, uh, like not even the police, they're like, Oh, I don't know. It's a concert. Right. Well, <laughs> obviously all you know, these dreadheads show up with like, you know, vials and kind and you're like, Ooh. and, uh, and it was awesome. And it was such a clean scene. And, you know, really nice and caring and quiet. Um, and it reminded you of like the good stuff on Dead Tour that we were starting to lose a little bit on the East Coast. Yeah, it was get, it definitely by the time I was on, it was like a full on, you know, Shakedown Street was literally like a city and, right. you know, commerce was happening. And, uh, but, you know, but at the same time, once you got inside and you sat down, you know, you're sitting next to people who are my age. You know, I was 17 when I first went and, and people who had been there since 70 or, 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 or you know, whenever. And, and you know, it, is this your first show? And, you know, everybody was just really cool and, and uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't really matter, you know, the age difference. You know, everybody was really helpful and wanted to, you know, just talk about the dead. And there was always mischief, you know. I mean, um, I mean, I'll I'll be honest. Like the uh, the the show that really kind of 
you know, rang my bell and it changed my world was uh, 11185 in Richmond. No, I didn't have a ticket. And I was like, you know, I was a total punk rocker. People aren't going to sell me a ticket. <laughs> but there's old, some old hippie guy who's like, come with me, you know? And uh, I don't know. I was like, okay. He's a cool guy. I've been hanging out with him earlier in the day. Um, followed him and, and, and uh, his girlfriend walked out of the crowd at a perfectly synchronized time and popped the door for us and we walked in. <laughs> Nice job. No, and no yeah. cell phone, just just knew what time to be. They had there. a time and they knew where to go and the whole thing. And, you know, it's like. Very nice. Um, but, you know, that's, is that gay crashing? Like, uh, at, at least you didn't, you didn't destroy anything. So I, I, I think, you know, maybe you the slipped people in. People who followed us did. Uh, well, Because okay. the people saw what happened and then. Uh, like, you know, oh, that's a good idea. Right. <laughs> right. I was yeah. just an idiot. Like, okay, sure, I'll follow you, dude. Yeah, yeah we're all we're all young ones, right? <laughs> Do, doing questionable things in questionable places. But, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, all right, so this this Warlock show, what did you think about that Dark Star? Was it, had you, had you, okay, so you had been around before they'd stopped playing Dark Star. Was mm -hmm. it? Was it the uh, was it the one for you? I, I, so, yeah, I really I mean, this is like my you know probably my fiftieth show or something like that, and like yeah. um, I don't even know. Like I I you know I, I thought of that era. I, so I, I listened to the one from the Greek in eighty four a lot mm -hmm. because I really loved the way that it was sort of a bubbly eighties sound. And I, I still think that one is a really unique standalone Dark Star. Um, from what is that seven thirteen eighty four or something? Um, there was like that, uh, you know. It was like there was a comet and a, you know, I don't know, a, an eclipse or whatever. you know, it's the typical Grateful Dead stuff in Berkeley, right? Nice. Um, so that one made sense, and then there was the eighty one New Year's one, which made sense because that was New Year's Eve. Um, but prior to that, like it wasn't really a part of the eighties repertoire. And yeah. I was always someone who like, I think a lot of younger deadheads, maybe in the eighties were really hungry for that older psychedelic grateful dead. Definitely. And, you know, uh, to be fair, um, any self-respecting taper or deadhead would know that like by, you know, the eighties, they had a pattern, right? It's like China red or estimated eyes, you know, yeah. fire. Uh, other one more fast, something's not a fade away about you know what I mean? Like yeah. you'd be like, Oh yeah, I got the set list. People would At, be like Yeah, the first sets were definitely more creative set list wise. I, you know, the you know, you still had your country slot and your Dylan slot and your sort of jam song slot. Yeah. And then, you know, and then but but the song choices were a little bit more random, I felt and like. And they and they mixed it up in eighty five with the song choices. And there was a little bit more raunchy blues and that celebratory 20 year thing. But what I really noticed coming back um, in the summer of 89 and then in the fall was psychedelia, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when that Dark Star hit, it wasn't like a uh, surprise. It was like, thank you. <laughs> you know, like yeah. finally, like, yeah, like this and is who you both are versus yeah you got both verses too which doesn't always happen yeah Pretty cool yeah. And, you know and it's like i almost wanted to toast jerry like you know good for you to like just like say like this is who i am and fuck it it's not going to really change because we are what we are mm -hmm. and that can be a hard thing you know when pop culture and all the media and all the forces of the world are against you because everyone was like you know all the forces of the, the media universe, except for their cute touch of gray thing, were like, oh, old hippies, we need to throw them in jail. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I mean, yeah, from following them around San Francisco to, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. It was really <laughs> kind of like galvanizing. I don't know. To me. But Hmm. What's what's the tipping moment? What, what what was the moment? I mean, Touch of Grey came out, but was it was it the video? I mean, what was it? Was it was it Al Gore and, and Tipper Core going to a show or like what? 
what was the tipping moment? I don't, you, you know, I don't think so. I think like, you know, um, from, uh, you know, the summer of 1987, there was a lot of nostalgia about the 60s. Mm -hmm. And MTV was like doing this whole thing about like the summer of love and like 20 years since like Kate Ashbury. And they would, you know, play all these segments that I think people had never seen before. Um, you know, footage of like, you know, Monterey and, um, you know, people playing in the park and um, different festivals and stuff. And I think that people who at that point would have been in their 40s and maybe had kids who are starting to get older, like graduating high school and stuff, start getting nostalgic for their youth, right? Yeah. Um, and I think they drove a, a real resurgence in interest. True. Yeah. And, and by then, so many people at some point in their, in their life had, had gone to see the dead, you know, that we just like had yeah. sort of Grateful Dead herd immunity or something, you know, so. You know, so like 89 was a really interesting time because I was seeing like Soundgarden and um, I, I had a, a friend who was trying to get me to go see this band Nirvana who I never saw, but, um, you know, like saw a ton of Sonic Youth and Yola Tango and like all these other bands that like, to me, like really shaped the next 20, 25 years of, of rock, which is yeah. a dwindling art, right? Which is the, the Foo Fighters now, that's... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> Whatever uh, means, that's where I'm at. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, kind of a wall, it's, it's just, you know, it's just all the same volume, it seems like, there's no dynamics right. to it right but, but that's just me you know in 1989 like fugazi was an interesting thing like mm. whoa, what's this you know like ian mckay is doing something um and there was a there was a sense that i felt of mixing and and i in my vision and my dreams you know never came to pass because i thought that the punk and the dead worlds were going to merge and come into this new you know yeah. gonna put like you know unified anarchist future that yeah well you know yeah no, that, that's what they thought in the 60s too but yeah <laughs> and, people factionalized and, and started arguing about their fashions and i was like oh yeah okay, never yeah. mind Perhaps, you know, they say, you know, that the, everything's kind of a circle, so maybe it'll, it'll roll around again. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, we have some things to take care of right now that are on, on different levels, maybe. You know, I'll tell you one thing, though, what I was really glad about on that 10980 show, uh, 10989, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. was I was glad to be challenged. Yeah. Um, if you listen to the sort of the outro of the Dark Star, like, the first part of the Dark Star is like pandemonium, right? Mm -hmm. And then Jerry's like, okay, I guess I got to sing because otherwise they're not going to shut up, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know who said it. I think it was John Scott or someone said, uh, I think Jerry likes the lyrics to Dark Star like he, he likes talking to his oncologist or something. <laughs> Like yeah, interesting metaphor. <laughs> they're, it's, they're always a little bit like ah, yeah. okay. Um, and then uh, after the second verse, there there's a part where they start to push the the, the pre drum space thing where they're they're pushing. I'm a I'm a, like a punk rock guy. I'm a Sonic yeah. Youth guy at this moment. They're pushing my tolerance of like sonic, you know, dissonance, dissonance, and and the... volume and everything. Where I'm like, what? Like I have never seen the Grateful Dead banging on their instruments before. I it, that's what I was. You know, I made a note here that the, the interesting. I mean, there was some MIDI going on, so somebody was playing some drums. It sounded like Jerry was playing some drums at some point, and uh, it got into the oboe sound, and then there was lots of clanging going on, and. And uh, it was definitely uh, dissonant and interesting. And, and you know, I, I think that some of that MIDI stuff, uh, do you know how long they'd been using that? From from my, from my what I'd seen, it'd been like a month or two they had really started using they MIDI They started experimenting in, in 1988. 
Okay, so you went um, back that far. And and mostly at I think in West Coast shows, because um, okay. they're close to their home and their studio and um, all their toys, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they really brought out in the, on the road in uh, the summer of '89 in space. Yeah, it, it definitely sounded like new stuff that they were they were having fun with, like yes. yeah, just just trying and. There, there are a few points, like in the space section, once, once making Billy go away, where you get the feeling everybody's just kind of like pressing pedal buttons, going through whatever, just seeing what the sound makes and what the sound <laughs> makes. Always and, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more so than making something creative and, and just kind of checking some shit out and seeing what happens. But, you know, they they get it together and it, and it all gels. But it, it's kind of a funny segment there where you just get like the, the oboe and the clanging and the... And the and weird drum sounds coming from either Brent or Jerry. I, I'm not really sure who that was. Well, and, and the volume level was getting up. It was getting to that frenzied pitch where, um, you know, someone who was coming for their pleasant like Sugar Magnolia experience is definitely going to be pushed to their like, why are they doing this to me? You know, <laughs> um, which is where I'm like, yeah, this, yeah. Is, <laughs> this is where I want to be. Yeah, and then and then they take all that into what, death. Don't have no mercy, which well was that just, so that blew my mind, and I knew just heavy. I didn't heavy. I guess I had known abstractly that they had played that at Shoreline, but like when I heard them play that, I mean, I was at that moment, no offense or whatever, but I was I thought I was actually being transported back in time. <laughs> I've been, I've had those moments, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, that was just, that was heavy. Uh, the, the lyric delivery from everybody, uh, through that whole song is just heavy. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the guitar solo, the Jerry rips and, and just the whole thing. Wow. Just like, wow. And it, well, it kept escalating. And, and, you know, for me, that's why the, like the, uh, sequence of songs that might be like, um, I don't know what follows, like throwing stones and good loving or something like that. Dear Mr. Um, Fantasy in between. Them. Right, right, right. Um, y- you know, to me, like at that point, it's like it's already been like I'm just sort of going on fumes here. Like this is so amazing. Um, the part that actually took me off guard the most and really disarmed me was when they started playing Addicts of My Life. Yeah. Um, and at that point, I just started sobbing. <laughs> <laughs> it, and, listening uh, was listening like, to, oh, my God, what is go- what's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Such a great song. And, and listening to it, I noticed that, you know, the, the, the guitar line starts. And, 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 and everyone's kind of like, like, wait, what is this? Oh, what? And then uh, uh, and then the, the lyrics hit and it just erupts like everybody's like, oh, it is that. You know, uh, you could just tell, um, like, there was just, like, that tentative, like, a couple of woos, and then as soon as they hit the lyrics and everybody's in there, and and you just hear the place erupt, like, they knew. Uh, that it and was you know how things are when you're, when you're young, you know, you're a kid, you're, like, on the scene or whatever, and it's like, you know, there's factions of people or this, that, and the other thing that, you know, that when you realize when you're older, like, that none of it matters. <laughs> yeah. um, and... You know, I, I saw this guy who I would have thought was like the the coolest of the cool, you know, kind of people. Mm-hmm. And he was just sobbing. And he and this guy just gave me this huge hug. Um and we were both like sobbing, you know, it's like <laughs> Yeah, man, like what you know Wow. What an emotional catharsis. Um you know, nothing could have punctuated the energy of that night more than I think that encore, because that was like, that was like, if we, if we already have you in the boat, we're now going to club you. <laughs> I mean, that was, right. I was going to, I was sort of done. I'm like, eh, I've done my like summer tours. Like, you know, mm-hmm. saw a lot of dead shows. I'm a Gen X guy. I got to go to see like, I had to go more to Luna shows or something or the chills, you know, whatever it was I was into. And went to that Warlock show and it was like, 
whatever else I was interested in. I'm sorry, it just took a back seat for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, had I was just same I was moment. back on tour. Like, yeah. wow. I mean, yeah, can't help but not to. But you know, I, I've said it before. The the Grateful Dead, they'll let you know when you've been at a good show by the, by the encore. So you're going to get something like Addicts or Bid You Good Night or something. I'm not sure that I know many encores that are quite as stunning as that. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> I I was lucky to get an Addicts uh, in Riverport, uh, wow. St. Louis one year. Uh, just. You know, one of those songs that I always said, you know, tonight's the night, tonight's the night. And mm. it actually was the night. So it was a good night. Well, and that was part of the other thing was that um, in 89, there was a great resurgence of vocal harmonies, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because there had been so many years of 1980s um, Jerry sounding like he'd just been, you know, smoking a retread on a tire all night before and singing for you. Now, yeah. um, and suddenly they had like sort of barbershop, you know, harmonies. Mm -hmm. And the throw that addicts out there was like, what? Totally. That's a, you know, those vocals, that's what kind of, I had a buddy who, who got me into the dead originally. And uh, it was just, it was never really on my radar, but you know, driving around in his car, he'd, he'd be playing shows and I'd be like, damn dude, turn this off. Like that voice is just, just you know he'd be playing 80 shows and because that's what he had at the time and he's yeah. like no 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 you gotta go you gotta go it's 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 just you gotta go and so uh, he bought my ticket to, to the first show and i went and, and and you know i did agree with him uh so uh you know it, it was definitely acquired taste and i acquired it very quickly that night and uh, <laughs> before that i was just like you know this is he's that wasn't the greatest singer court in indianapolis was it what's that that wasn't that tennis court in Indianapolis, was it, in uh, 1984? Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm not sure what he was listening to, but it, it wasn't uh, great. <clears throat> no, I meant your first uh, show. Oh, no, no, no. My uh, first one I saw was uh, 6791 at Deer Creek. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was a good one. There was a, have, you, uh, have you heard that 84 one from the, the tennis court? Uh, no. Uh, again, I'm going to make another oh note Oh, my here. gosh. That is, is like, from, it's one of my Indy? favorite Grateful Dead stories, too, because it's like, Right before they went to Alpine, summer of 84, and people went nuts, and Indianapolis was like, sure, we can host these people at a tennis court. <laughs> Weird. I, I had a tape of them playing at like Market Square, maybe from, I think it was like 85 or something. But yeah, no, I didn't know about the tennis court. I've had to check that oh, that's out. That's awesome, yeah. But I'm Wonderful. sure it's on archive. And I, you know, and I love the mid-80s because... Um, it was just culture, you know, it wasn't about the radio hits or, or anything else. There was no internet sharing of ideas. It was, it was culture. Like it was all word of mouth and you met people who knew people who said something and, you know, and it's like, you just discovered this whole world um, by having to show up. So, okay, so typically, you know, at, at the end I ask, you know, what, what was it about this show that, that made you pick this particular one to talk about? But it's pretty obvious. I mean, it's that's a killer show. Well, um, no, it's, I, I don't think it's obvious at all. I think um, no? the, the story is that I was going to basically quit. I was done. Yeah. I was a Gen Xer, man. I was like, I did my 80s Grateful Dead time, you know. I'm like, I'm off to greener pastures with, like, you know, Soundgarden and, you know, uh, Fugazi and like, I was really into Sonic Youth and seeing Yellow Tango at the time and <clears throat> like smaller butthole surfers, you know, like yeah. smaller groups like this are going to break through and create this like whole new thing. And the dead just sucked me right back in after, after the Warlocks. They came know, for I you. did spring and summer and fall tour and <laughs> and it was 1990 was like just grateful that time nice yeah awesome awesome well Keith thank you for uh, for joining me today and, and talking Thanks, about bro. this I appreciate having you uh, having you on it was good talking man for sure alright take care alright hey now do you have a great story about a Grateful Dead show you were at 
I'd love to hear it and maybe have you on the podcast. Send me an email at will at talesfromthelot.org and let me know what show you would like to talk about and what made it so special to you.